All right, this one, this one did it. It, it broke me. Okay, I, I, there are 12 books in the House of Night series, and over the course of like two weeks, I read the first half of them, or read the first half. I listened to them uh, audiobook, and they're, it's all sped up, and I could do it while doing other stuff, so it was super convenient. But uh, yesterday, I finished book six, and I just decided, you know what, book seven onwards, I'm going to get them digitally from the library and read through them, because I can, I can do it faster that way. I just have to, you know, focus on it. And uh, I stayed up until 6 a.m. this morning reading all the, all the books just because I wanted it done. Okay, I wanted to take my notes, finish reading, and then just record this and get it out of my mind because <laughs> this is the worst series ever, okay? Because as bad as things like uh, Throne of Glass or Elixir or shit, even the Lovely Bones, as bad as those are, they, they were pretty normal, I guess you would say. House of Night is a mad collection of ravings, okay? Like, My Immortal, you know, that terrible fan fiction I did a read-through of not long ago. Um, this feels like a story that Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway would write if she were a real person, okay? I'm not exaggerating when I say that. This, this has, like, a weird pseudo-gothic feel to it. There's the main character having sex with like 18 different dudes and it's all about how amazing she is just for the sake of being amazing. I'm really not exaggerating when I say that Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway could have written this. Okay, and um... It's just um, it's it's really bad. This is a long intro. Let's let's get started. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. For context, before I really get into this, I just wanted to mention that Throne of Glass, the last one I did, which required three parts, which were almost three hours long altogether, and I, I, I did the math on that one. That series is around 4,400 pages altogether, and I had eight and a half pages of notes written down for it. House of Night, uh, even though it's a there's more books in the series. The page count is around 3,700, give or take. I have 13 pages of notes for that. Yeah, the, the, this whole thing in, in my notebook, that, that is all House of Night stuff, just to give you, give you an idea. And I know you're probably expecting me to play that clip from Twilight of Michael Sheen doing the funny laugh. <laughs> uh, I'm only going to play it once, and I need to save it for a good spot, so... um. Anyways, let's get started. So, House of Night, book one, marked. So, it starts off with a uh, pretentious quote. It's all about Atlas holding up the sky. And like most pretentious quotes in terrible young adult stories, it doesn't tie into the actual story at all, so I'm not sure why it, uh, why it was put in at all. But then we're introduced to our main character, whose name is Zoe. Now, Zoe is, at this point, a regular 16-year-old high school girl who is just complaining about her geometry test. You know, she lives in Oklahoma, and she has a friend named Cal, and in her inner narration, because it's from Zoe's POV, um, she's talking about how Cal is just this dumb girl. Like, she's obsessed with boys and makeup and that sort of thing. And so according to Zoe, she's dumb, even though she thinks of her as her best friend. But Zoe is also kind of dumb, and like a stereotypical teenage girl who's just complaining about school and stuff, so... You know, it's a great intro to our main character, you know, have her insult her best friend and make her look like a terrible person. That's, that, that's, that's our introduction to this character. But uh, don't worry, we don't have to spend long with that, because not long after that, like, in the middle of school, Zoe gets marked by a vampire. Now. This is one of the ideas in this series that it's not even a good idea that's executed badly. It's like the seed of a good idea. Like if you were to alter what they did with it a little bit and then execute it better, then it might have been an okay story. Might. Okay, no guarantees there. I or, or, hell, it wouldn't have even been a good story necessarily, but, like, this part of it wouldn't have been as bad. But basically, 
in this world, vampires are public knowledge. You know, they, they've always been public knowledge. You know, from what I understand, True Blood uh, also has a similar plot where vampires are revealed to the general public, but I've never read it or watched the show, so I can't really comment on that or if there's any similarities. But, yeah, vampires are public knowledge, and you don't get turned into a vampire by being bitten or anything like that. Basically, you... Some people just turn into vampires at, when they're teenagers, you know? Like, once they reach around 16, they start the transformation. They're referred to as fledglings, and over the course of the next couple of years, they turn into full vampires. And the vamp that sees Zoe in her school and uh, marks her, he's what's known as a tracker. So they, like, just go out and find kids that are about to turn into vampires and... It's never really made clear if they are the ones that sort of kickstart the process, or if the process was already there and the trackers just find them. I think it's the second one, but I'm not sure. But anyways, this guy very publicly uh, outs her as a vampire and tells her, You need to go to the House of Night! And uh, she, so she gets this uh, weird tattoo symbol on her forehead, which is the mark of vampires. And uh, this, this is one of the dumb parts of the series. Like... As they become uh, closer to being full vampires, the marks grow and turn into tattoos that cover their whole bodies. Like that is just so gothic and edgy. It's so it's so stupid. So apparently, even though vampires are known to the public, they don't interact with humans all that much, and humans see them as being kind of scary for uh, really no reason. Like we'll get more into that later, but the humans see them as being kind of scary and weird and out there because they're, I don't know, they're just vampires, so everyone at her school kind of immediately distances themselves uh, from her. And she, she knows, like, oh, this is gonna be, like, my last day at this school, I'm not gonna be able to see my friends anymore. I'm gonna have to go to the House of Knights. That's a boarding school. It's And she's treating it like it's really far away. And, you know, you hear about the House of Night. It's a school where young vampires learn to control their powers and then enter vampire society and become these, not immortal, but very long-lived creatures of the night. So you hear that and you might think, oh, this must be in some, like, abandoned castle in Romania. Or maybe it's a hilltop temple in the mountains, somewhere in Alaska, or, you know, somewhere far away. It's in fucking Tulsa, Oklahoma, okay? And Zoe lives in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, which, uh, according to Google, that's an 18-minute drive away. So, you're... <sighs> there are places in my own city that take more than that to drive, and I still go to them regularly. Well, not right now, because, you know, we're quarantined, but... I, she's treating it like she's never going to see her friends or family again, and it's, okay, okay, yeah, okay. I also want to point out that despite having 13 pages of notes here, I wrote down maybe a quarter of what I could have, because partway through the second book, I realized that I, I just would not have time to hit on every little stupid moment or every little stupid line. And so I start skipping over more and more stuff so I can just hit the major plot and character beats. So just keep that in mind as we go ahead that it might seem like these get better after the second or third book. They don't, trust me. So Zoe goes home to her mother, her older sister, her younger brother, and her stepfather, who she refer refers to as the step loser throughout the story. And, um, her father isn't really in the picture, like, I think they only mention him once or twice in the entire series, and they kind of just say that, like, yeah, he, he left us, and I don't really talk to him anymore, which, um, I, uh, okay, I, I guess that, uh, again, that's like a seed of an okay idea, where it's just like, yeah, my dad is an asshole, and he's no longer in my life, so I just don't think about him anymore, and th that doesn't bother me, like, that, that could be... You know, that could be interesting, it's just how parents are sometimes like that in real life. It sucks, but they aren't always, like, evil villains. They didn't always leave you to go off and become magical heroes or anything. Sometimes they just leave. So, that, uh, whatever. Anyways, 
So everyone is angry at Zoe for turning into a vampire, even though it's not her fault, it's just a biological thing that happens sometimes, and uh, her mom is super angry at her for some reason, and her stepfather is... apparently he's a very religious man, he's a leader in their local church, and he thinks that vampires are like the work of Satan or something, so like Zoe's not religious enough, she's not following Jesus enough, and that's why. And um, also, as this is happening, uh, Zoe is complaining about her older sister being a slut and having sex with lots of dudes. And um, Zoe repeatedly refers to other women who have more than one boyfriend at... And not even at the same time, but like if you're in more than one relationship, she refers to them as sluts or hoes. And I just want you to keep that in mind as we go ahead. Like, she even hates her own sister for this. But basically, her mom... Uh, blows up at Zoe over this. She's like, you're ruining everything, blah, blah, blah. And Zoe's like, well, you're the one that ruined my life. You brought the, your uh, your new husband in here, the step loser. And um, he hates us. He runs our lives all terribly. And, like, this might have been a good thing, but it just happens out of nowhere, so there's no build to it whatsoever. And also, Zoe's mom just straight up says, like, we... What, we only married him for money. Like, you know, we get to live in this nice big house and everything, which is very... Why would you point that out? So when her stepfather hears about this, he tries to gather up people from their church to, as Zoe puts it, pray away the vampire. It, okay, which, um, obviously it doesn't work because it's a biological thing, and, um... Yeah, I, I don't have anything else to say about that. It's just really stupid. And Zoe sneaks off to go and visit her grandmother. Now, her grandmother is a Cherokee, and throughout this whole series, Zoe is, like, weirdly obsessed with Cherokee stuff. Like, she constantly refers... Well, maybe not constantly, but a lot of the time she refers to herself as Cherokee and refers to uh, their rituals and their magic and everything, and it's, um... It just feels weird and out of place, because it, it could have been a neat addition, but it just doesn't mesh with all this other vampire stuff and all this other magic stuff. And uh, quite frankly, after the first, like, four books, I kind of kept forgetting that Zoe was a Cherokee, even though she kept bringing it up. It's... it's weird. Okay, while she's at her grandmother's house, Zoe, um, has this vision sort of thing where she meets Nyx, and Nyx is the goddess of vampires. She's the goddess of night. And Nyx just tells Zoe, you're so special, you're destined for great things, you're amazing. And, um... Yeah, that's, that's stupid, because... We just barely have gotten to know Zoe, we've just barely gotten to know this world. Actually, hell, we haven't gotten to know this world, because they haven't even really gotten into the vampire stuff yet, but we, we've we barely gotten to know any of this, and we are already being told that the main character is special. She's a chosen one, and she's gonna do great things. And she's not destined for any real reason. You know, she doesn't save things for, by, you know, being a good leader. She doesn't save things by uh, being hardworking or determined or intelligent or anything like that. She's just, she's destined to do things. She's destined to be a hero. And we don't even know what she's destined to do at this point. We just know she's super special and cool. Like, that's the, the whole point this scene was put in. And so, from this point on, and I'll, I'll bring it up periodically throughout this. This, this is going to be a long video, jeez. Uh, but throughout all of this, just remember that Zoe is totally a Mary Sue, and I don't use that term lightly, okay? I, I feel other people use it way too often, but in this instance, yes, Zoe is a total Mary Sue because she's just chosen by God for no real reason, and as we go through this, you'll see why. Zoe passes out after her vision quest, or whatever you want to call it, and she wakes up, she's already at the House of Night, which as a brief aside, um, shouldn't the House of Night have, like, a way for vampires to 
go to the school, like, like to be transported there? Because, I mean, the tracker vampire that finds Zoe, um, he's never named, I don't think, and he just leaves afterwards. Like, he doesn't even give her a phone number or anything. Like, hey, if you need to get to the House of Nights, uh, just call this number and a driver will come and pick you up, or something like that. That would, that would make sense, because, you know, Zoe lives a 20-minute drive away, so it wouldn't be that hard to pack up her stuff and leave. But what if someone lived in, like, another state or something? And they mentioned there's multiple houses of nights, sure, but what if you're still a long drive away and you just can't take the time to get there? Like, whatever, that, that's a brief aside. And she passes out and wakes up at the school, <clears throat> and there waiting for her are, you know, her grandmother, who took her there, but also uh, the high priestess of the school, the leader of the school, uh, who's named Neferet. And Neferet just... Um, starts off by saying, you know, welcome to the House of Night, and then she gives a bunch of exposition, and she starts off with, as you know. And there's really no worse way to let your audience know that you're just spewing exposition for their sake than by starting it with, as you know. Because if, if she knows, why are you telling her? That's like me saying, as you know, Colorado is a part of the United States. Like, yeah, no, no shit. Why? If you don't know that, then I would just say Colorado is part of the United States. That's, that's so stupid. And so anyways, um, Neferet goes into this whole long spiel about um, the vampires and about the House of Night. So basically, it, it is a regular boarding school where vampires learn to control their powers. And apparently they have uh, magic powers, you know, uh, a lot of them have affinities for the five elements, you know, air, fire, water, earth, and uh, spirit. You know, not all of them, but a lot of them do have that. Uh, you know, so they can use them for magic things. It's not really explained very well at this point, uh, or for the rest of the series, for that matter. But, you know, it's, um, they can use magic things, and cats are also apparently super uh, attracted to them. You know, so there's just cats wandering around, and not long after this, um, a cat just goes up to Zoe, and they become friends immediately, so, you know, that that's cool and all. And, uh, apparently vampires have, like, internal clocks that tell them when it's day or night, so, like, you know, you can wake up and be like, oh, it's, like, deep in the middle of the night, so I'm good, or you can be like, oh, dawn's almost coming, so I'm also good, because vampires, uh, don't actually get hurt by sunlight in this, like, it's a it's uncomfortable for them, as they put it, but um, throughout this whole series, Zoe and them go out in the sunlight without much trouble. Like, you know, Zoe will wear a hat to shave her head. Great. But, like, she doesn't even have to... Well, they might have put on sunblock, I don't remember. And um, you can suck my dick if you think I'm going back to check. But basically they could have they couldn't have even done something like Cirque de Freak did where vampires are just really sensitive to sunlight and so if they go out and you know full vampires not half vampires but if they if they go out they have to wear tons of sunblock otherwise they turn into a lobster like right away and i'm not even done with page 1 of my notes <laughs> Okay, after Zoe is briefly introduced to the House of Night and all that, she um, goes out into the halls to find her room, and... Okay, okay, so she's out in the hallway, and there's only two people there. There's a dude, and there's a girl on her knees who is trying to suck his dick, and he doesn't want her to. She, she's, like, trying to say, come on, you know you want it, that sort of thing. And he's like, no, come on, we're not together anymore, that sort of thing. And then she cuts him and through his jeans and starts drinking his blood. And as Zoe is watching this, she says it, quote, reminds her of the girls who used to give guys blowjobs like they used to give gum. Or more accurately, suckers. So... You know, I just wanted to bring that line up because it's really stupid. But yeah, so Zoe watches this for a minute, then goes, ugh, and then leaves. Now, I bring that up because those two characters both become pretty important to the series 
as this goes on. The first one is named Aphrodite, and we'll get into her later plenty, don't worry. The second one is Eric, and Eric is, at least at first, the main love interest of Zoe throughout this whole series. You know, a long time ago, ba like back when my channel had probably 30 subscribers, I read this terrible Wattpad story called Muslima Next Door, and you can check it out if you want. It's an old video, so like the video quality is really low and all that, but in that story, it, it was basically just a you know Muslim girl in America who falls in love with this white, non-Muslim dude, and the way they met in that story was that he was having a party at his house and being really loud and obnoxious and all that, and so she went over and tried to tell him to, you know, calm down a little bit, and he, like, holds up vodka in front of her face and starts trying to scare her off with it, like it's garlic to a vampire or something. Um, and then not long afterwards, she goes home, and he throws a rock through her window, and it crashes and hits her in the head, and she has to be hospitalized. And that's the way the two love interests were introduced to each other in that story. I didn't think I would find a worse way for love interests to be introduced, but then I read House of Night, and the main love interests are introduced when the protagonist sees him being sexually assaulted by another girl in a hallway, and she looks on with confusion, disgust, and horror, and then sees him getting his blood drank, and she goes, ugh, and then leaves. That... that's worse. A apparently Aphrodite is the leader of this school group called the Daughters and Sons of Darkness, and it's never made clear exactly what their purpose is. Like, okay, they're definitely just like a social club, but like, what's their stated purpose or their intended purpose? That's never brought up. Um, and she really hates Zoe just, um, just because, I guess. You know, she, she's like a bully mean girl, and so she just hates Zoe just, just because. There's no um, real reason for that. And um, it's specifically mentioned that she looks like a combination of Sarah Jessica Parker and other celebrities. And that, that, that... Okay, I need to take a moment to talk about this series' world building because, you know, obviously I'm the world building guy. That's what I, <laughs> that's what I like to talk about. But so in this world, vampires have just always been around and they, you know, they use magic and stuff and they live hundreds of years longer than humans and the world is still exactly the same as ours. Like, had it done something like what True Blood did, where vampires were only recently introduced to the populace, at least I think that's what True Blood is. Again, I haven't watched it. But had they done something like that, that would have been acceptable. But in this, the world is exactly the same, and they specifically make a bunch of mentions to other pop culture, uh, referen uh, pop culture icons and celebrities and such like Harry Potter, and uh, they mentioned Game of Thrones a little bit at the end, and they specifically bring up a bunch of celebrities that are vampires, and they confirm them as vampires. They confirm William Shakespeare, Sarah Jessica Parker, Kenny Chesney, Garth Brooks, and Jake Gyllenhaal, and possibly a few others I missed, are all confirmed as vampires. And it's just, that makes no sense, because if there were these uh, nigh-immortal, powerful, magical beings running around, History wouldn't have unfolded the same. Okay, I'm, I'm amazed I have to keep pointing this out. So, Zoe manages to make friends with this group of other outcasts who Aphrodite refers to as the nerd herd because... I don't know, I guess she's a really big fan of Chuck. Um, but Aphrodite refers to them as the nerd herd. They're kind of outcasts, but honestly, I don't see why. They seem like totally normal people o overall. They're just... They're outcasts because, but anyways, I, I bring this up because these are her main friends throughout the series, and uh, none of them are that important other than this girl named Stevie Ray, and we'll talk more about her later, but at this point she's, she's pretty inconsequential. And the others have basically no personality. And then there's one named Damien who is gay. And, okay, okay, so he's gay, but he's also like the nerd stereotype, where he brings up uh, obscure facts and knowledge all the time and tells the others about it and like, oh yes, blah, blah, blah. And he's the only dude that hangs out with them. 
But at one point, uh, while they're talking about this, um, one, one of her friends says, we don't have any guys that hang out here. And they're like, well, what about Damien? And she says, well, he's gay, so he doesn't really count as a guy. Which, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty homophobic. I'll, I'll put that out there. Uh, and I, I mentioned that on Twitter a while ago, and other gay people said, yeah, that's homophobic. So I'm not alone in thinking that. Um, but then immediately afterwards, Zoe starts talking about how, how much she hates homophobes. Like her stepfather, you know, the very religious guy is also apparently homophobic, and Damien's parents are, and... Cool, whatever. Damien gives her more of a rundown of the school, and apparently they're all divided into four grades, which are like third form, fourth form, fifth form, and sixth form. And I'm like, why not just call it first, second, third, and fourth years? Whatever. And also I should point out that um, because the vampire transformation takes about four years and most people turn when they're 16, that means basically if you become a vampire, you're going to be stuck in a high school-esque environment until you're 20 instead of, when you're, until, uh, instead of leaving when you're 18, which that sucks. And apparently they're also divided into like Harry Potter houses and... Uh, I didn't write down the names here, so I don't remember them, and they never mention them again after this. Um, but this is an important thing to mention because when I first started this, and before I started it, um, it came out in 2007, so I figured, you know, vampires around that time, it's going to be a Twilight ripoff. At this point, I realized it's much more of a Harry Potter ripoff. You know, think about it. You go to a magic school where you learn magic and do things and you're split into houses and well that, that's about it because you know in Harry Potter they're you know they're a magic school which is hidden from the world and all their classes revolve around like transfiguration and potions and stuff whereas in this um it's mostly just normal school stuff like yeah, that's it. Like, the only abnormal classes they mention are fencing, which admittedly does sound kind of cool. Like, I, I wish I went to a high school that offered that. Uh, they have some brief magic classes, but they don't really learn to do anything cool with their magic. You know, they don't really learn to throw fireballs or transform into bats or anything like that, which would be cool. And then the other one is vampire sociology. And I bring that up specifically because the term vampire sociology is so transcendentally stupid that I just need to share it with the world. And really, the vampires are just wizards from Harry Potter, except they're really boring and stupid. Like, because, again, they don't really need to drink blood to survive, at least not at first. Like, once they become full vampires, they have to. Um, they don't need to stay out of the sunlight, and they can't really do anything all that cool with their powers. So, really the only reason you'd want to become a vampire is because they live a lot longer. Like, that's the only benefit I can see to this. And, okay, I'm kicking this into overdrive because I'm less than a page and a half in. So, Zoe complains about her boobs and about other people's boobs, and she, she, she in my notes I wrote, just stop talking boobs in all caps, so you know, give you an idea. And, um, vampires are apparently matriarchal, which is weird because, um, throughout this series, it seems to be trying to give off some sort of girl power vibes, but it never, it, it never does. I, I never really got that sense. And I never really got the sense they were a matriarchal society either. It's just all the people in positions of power are women, cool, but they don't mistreat men or anything, which they, that could be an interesting bit of social commentary if you had bothered to try even a little bit, but, um, okay, and at this point we also learn that some vampire fledglings don't change, they die. Like, their body will, um, reject the change, and so one day they'll just stop breathing and fall on the ground and convulse for a little bit, and then they just die. Like, their body rejects the change. And again, that's, that's one of the few ideas that, or seeds of an idea that could have been good if they did anything with it, but they don't. And so Zoe goes off and parties with Aphrodite, and they pass around a thing of wine, or Zoe thinks it's wine because she's a dipshit. It's wine mixed with blood. And she's like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, then she's like, wait, I drank blood? 
I, I thought that was not allowed, and they're like, well, it's not from a human, it's from another vampire fledgling, because they can drink other vampires' blood, apparently. So then, Zoe's old human friends uh, attempt a rescue operation. It, it's weird, they, they kind of break into the school, go over the wall, and then try to get her to leave, and she's like, um, no, I, I, I actually kind of like it here for whatever reason, because she really hates her friends all of a sudden. Like, her old sort of boyfriend is named Heath, and uh, I bring him up because he'll be important after this, but uh, Heath, and she goes on these long anti-marijuana, anti-drinking uh, tirades about him, because apparently she hates that he drinks and smokes, and, okay, don't get me wrong, doing that sort of thing too much is definitely an issue, but they don't really talk about it like he does it too much. They talk about it like he has beers when he's out with friends. And granted, he is underage, so I'm not, like, encouraging that type of behavior. I'm just saying it's not really that big a deal. But, you know, anyways, while she's hanging out with Heath and them and telling them to leave, um, she accidentally drinks some of his blood. And um, then, then after that, they leave. And Zoe notices that she's changing into a full vampire a little bit faster, and it might be because she drank some of Heath's blood, it might be not. Whatever. Uh, she talks to Eric, and Eric was the dude in the hallway who was um, trying to avoid getting his dick sucked. Wow, I did not think I was going to be saying that sentence today. And they talk a little bit, and he's like, yeah, I used to date Aphrodite, but not anymore. And she mentions that or he mentions that he didn't actually let her blow him, so... Good job! So, yeah, she kisses Eric, and, like, they're kind of a thing now. And then it recaps the entire story. Okay? Uh, it recaps literally everything that has happened in the, over the course of several pages. And keep in mind, we're, this isn't a long book, okay? We're like 200 pages in at this point, and it decides, yeah, let's recap every little thing that's happened. And that does not end here, okay? Throughout this entire series, around, I'm not exaggerating, around 7 to 10% of it is just recapping stuff that's already happened. So, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna bring it up too much more after this, because I don't want to repeat myself, but, oh fuck, I'm 35 minutes in, jeez. Uh, I, yeah, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but just keep in mind, as I'm going through this, uh, one, we're getting a bunch of recaps throughout, and two, we're getting tons of really, really terrible lines throughout, which I'm not bringing up that much, but just know that the prose is terrible, okay? Like, the descriptions are occasionally passable, like, when it's describing what people look like, and, you know, the, the way their eyes shine, and that sort of thing. But, um, all the really dumb lines drag it down. It's terrible. So just know that throughout, that throughout this whole thing. After this, we learn that apparently Aphrodite gets, uh, visions of the future. L like, she'll just randomly stop and see something, and, yeah, it's something that bad that'll happen, usually. But she never tells anybody for, uh, some reason. I, I don't know. And, um... Apparently, at some point in the past, she saw a vision of a plane crashing and didn't tell anybody, and uh, one of Zoe's new friends overheard her talking about it, and so she had to uh, go to Neferet and the leaders of the school in order to tell them about it, and then they were able to stop the plane crash. So, just at, at this point, Aphrodite goes from being like a mean girl bully to being an actual sociopath. And, um, not in a fun way, just in a what-the-fuck way. Like, like I get the feeling the author didn't realize that Aphrodite was being a sociopath when she did that. So, anyways, um, Zoe, you know, continues to change fast, and apparently she has a connection to all five of the big elements, uh, which has never, ever been seen before. And so she's just super powerful without having to work for it, which, you know, makes her a really compelling protagonist. Thanks. And then she tells her grandma, and then her grandmother tells her, um, with great power comes great responsibility, because might as well rip off Spider-Man at this point. So, um, when we found out that sometimes vampire fledglings just die without changing, because their body rejects it, 
Uh, the, the one guy that we see die is named Elliot, and apparently he was the one whose uh, blood they drank at that uh, weird ritual party with Aphrodite when it was mixed with wine. And, um, so, Zoe joins the Dark Daughters to, quote, take down Aphrodite, and I, I, yeah, whatever, and Aphrodite, uh, tries to, um, attack her at one point, she's saying, like, you'll never take over, blah, 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 and she tries to punch her, and Zoe says that time slows down and she catches her wrist, but, um, I don't know if they meant that literally, or, like, she's using magic to actually slow time so she can react faster, or if her body has changed enough so her reflexes are faster, I, I, I don't know, whatever. So apparently, when she drank blood from her old human boyfriend, Heath, uh, they became imprinted on each other, which is basically just a bond between humans and vampires where there, there's telepathic, um, I'll, I'll link there, and so he's kind of obsessed with her, and he's leaving her a ton of messages on her phone and texting her and saying, call me, call me, call me, all that shit. You are with me. I love you. You can't just walk away. And um, then she see, then Zoe sees uh, Elliot's ghost, at least she thinks it's his ghost, wandering around, and she's like, whoa, that's weird. And then, um, okay, so when Zoe is, um, in order to take down Aphrodite, and join the Dark Daughters and become their new leader, um, Zoe does this weird ritual circle with her. And I want you to keep this in mind, like, ritual circles are basically where there's one person for each element, and then they put their powers together and do stuff. And none of it is particularly exciting, but at the same time they can do e anything they want, seemingly, with a ritual circle, because e every problem in the series is solved with that. You'll see what I mean as I go ahead, but Basically, she summons some, like, old spirits, and then uh, Heath comes, climbs over the school's wall, um, gets attacked by the spirits, and almost dies, but Zoe takes over the circle and banishes them. And then uh, Aphrodite kind of whines about it a little bit, and Zoe tells her off because she's just that cool, and then she gets made leader by Neferet, because, again, she's just that cool. And then Neferet uh, erases Heath's memory of the events, um, because... Apparently, if uh, he stays away from Zoe, like, their imprint hasn't fully manifested, so if he stays away from her long enough, then it'll just fade away or break, so he, he wants to erase, erase his memory and keep him away. Okay, and uh, Zoe's mark has become fancier, and... Because, again, Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway has to have cool tattoos, and everyone loves Zoe all of a sudden, and... Uh, Okay, so Neferet, in this case, uh, just making this student who has been here for, like, a week, the leader of the Dark Daughters, is... It's reminiscent of that scene at the end of the first Harry Potter book where Dumbledore just gives Gryffindor the house cup. And... I mean, at least Harry and them did things to earn that. Like, you know, obviously Dumbledore is showing some pretty clear bias there, I get that, but at least they did stuff to deserve their praise and everything, Z Zoe really didn't. Really, this story, at the end of the day, it makes promises it can't keep. Like, it's, a, it's supposedly a story about how vampires are cool and about how magic is cool and all that, I don't know. But it's really just high school drama throughout it all. And if you wanted to do that, you could have just removed vampires from it and made it a regular high school drama thing. Now, I just want to Mention real quick that uh, I have read the first book in the Vampire Academy series, which I read it like six years ago, and that that book had kind of the same problem, but that one was only like 70 to 80 percent high school drama stuff, and the last 20 to 30 percent was like an actual story. You know, there was an actual villain, and he was doing bad things, and one of the main characters had this special power which was slowly driving her insane and all that, but... This doesn't even have that. Okay, I know it gets it later on, but Jesus. So, that's the end of book one. Book two, Betrayal. Um, this one starts with uh, some sort of open house where the human parents of the vampires come in to see like what the school is like and all that. And um, apparently Damien is acting gayer than he usually does, which is weird. And then um, Zoe's mom and stepdad show up. 
Her siblings don't show up, they're never brought up again, I don't think. Or, they, they might have been once or twice more, I don't, I don't know. But, they, um, they show up, and they look around, and her stepfather's like, God, vampires are so stupid, and her mom is kind of just going along with him. And, um, Zoe talks about how, again, how her mom is only with this dude because he has money, and they live in a, quote, gigantic house. So, yeah, she combined the words huge and gigantic into one really stupid word. Um, and normally I wouldn't bring that up, but they use it a total of eight other times throughout the series, and I, I counted. They, they use it eight other times throughout the series, and while that's not a huge number, it's eight too many. So, while her stepdad is going around talking about how stupid vampires are and how evil they are, blah blah blah, Neferet comes and tells him off, and this scene... It's very unearned, but I guess it could have been worse, because she basically tells him, Hey, I wouldn't come into your church and talk shit about Jesus or whatever, like, so don't come into mine and talk shit about my goddess. Uh, but he can't handle it, so he's like, fine, I'll leave. And then he leaves with um, Zoe's mom as well, which, again, it's like, it's unearned emotion. Like, this could have been a moment where Zoe really feels like, Oh, God, my mom doesn't care about me, but it doesn't work. And also, apparently, uh, throughout all of this... Um, Apparently, as soon as students are inducted into the House of Night, they become legally emancipated, so it's not like her parents can force her to leave or anything. I um, feel like they should have to do some paperwork before that, but whatever. So, um, and while this is happening, Aphrodite's parents are also there, and uh, her parents are super wealthy and loaded. Her dad is actually the mayor of Tulsa, and they literally just give her an evil plan, and Zoe overhears it. Like, they, t they tell her, you need to disgrace that girl so that you can become the leader of the Dark Daughters again, because if you're not, then you're, you're not cool anymore. And, like, they, they literally just give her an evil plan. Oh my god. So Zoe is reforming the Dark Daughters. Uh, she wants to make it so that a couple of them are chosen and a bunch of them are elected. And she wants to make it... I, I don't know what they're supposed to do, but, you know, she wants to make it... Uh, more than just a social club for a tiny little uh, niche of people. And uh, she explains this all to one of the professors at the school whose name is Lauren, who's a poet apparently, and he voraciously flirts with her and gives her this dirty poem that he heard, and um, I really hated this part, let me tell you, because Lauren is this dude in his 20s. Zoe is 16. Okay, and she is a student at a school where he works. There is no situation in which this is acceptable behavior on his part, okay? And it wouldn't bother me nearly as much if it, there weren't so many shitty young adult stories that had this exact uh, sort of plot point where this teenage girl is in some sort of, becomes in some sort of relationship with a teacher of hers that's in his 20s, okay? Like, Vampire Academy did it, this one did it, Divergent did it, Pretty Little Liars did it, and the Throne of Glass kinda did it. Like, I mean, in that one, Selena was like 19 or 20, so it wasn't as bad, but Rowan was still her teacher in a position of authority over her, and he was still much, much older. So, you know, it's still kinda creepy. But anyways, yeah, Zoe is like, wow, I, th that dude's really cute. But you know what, whatever, I'm dating Eric, so she kiss kisses Eric. Um, one of her old schoolmates, uh, her old human schoolmates, goes missing, and Z Zoe just immediately assumes that he's dead. Um, okay, that's whatever. And, um, then Zoe goes and has dinner with Neferet, and they have, like, a long conversation about stuff, and, um, Neferet also agrees that her schoolmate is dead, again, with no evidence whatsoever. Like, they turn out to be correct, but, like, you should investigate before you come to conclusions like that, guys. Um, and apparently, Aphrodite has lost her future sight powers, or at least Neferet thinks she has, because Nyx no longer likes Aphrodite, it, it's not... whatever. And she talks about how impressed she is with Zoe for no reason, but, uh, you know, the important part is that, um, Eric and Heath and Zoe are now in a love triangle. Yeah, you could, that was like the one good thing about the first book is that they didn't feel the need to throw one of those in there. Like, Heath was kind of coming after Zoe, but she was not interested in him at all, and Aphrodite was kind of coming after Eric, but he wasn't interested in her at all. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, there's a love triangle now. And anyways, not long afterwards, they find the, the dead body of Zoe's schoolmate, so he really was dead, and then another uh, guy goes missing. And then uh, Aphrodite has a vision of Zoe's grandmother dying um, in, in a car crash, and she, bas she basically forces Zoe to... Well, whatever, eventually she tells Zoe about it, and they find out that there's a a bridge that's gonna collapse, and they're like, well, we can't tell everyone that Aphrodite had a vision, otherwise she'll be mad at us and she won't tell us any more visions. So the solution they come up with to get the bridge closed is they call it a fake bomb threat. And, um... Wouldn't it have been easier to just get in trouble with one of your schoolmates? Also, I just want to point out that when they call in the bomb threat, they pretend to be a fake terrorist group called Nature's Jihad. So, you know, make, make of that what you will. And, um, any, anyways, they recap a bunch of stuff. I, I shouldn't bring that up because you should just assume they recap stuff. And, um, she talks to the police and the police are like, hey, we think you killed people, but she was in school. So they're like, oh, okay, she's innocent. And at, not long after this, we learn that vampire fledglings apparently have to stay near full vampires or they die. Um, what? Like, like if, if, if vampire fledglings are not around full vampires for more than a couple of hours at a time, then, or a couple of days at a time, then they, they just die. And it, it, their bodies reject the change. Um, if that's the case, how are vampires around at all? Because wouldn't the first person who changed into a vampire not have been around any other full vampires and then just died? So then the next person wouldn't have any full vampires to be around, then they just die. Wouldn't people just start randomly dying? So uh, Zoe just goes out to shop, and then she meets Heath at the store, and um, he kind of flirts with her, but she's like, no, we can't be doing that anymore. And then, um, oh yeah, also I guess Lauren could be included in here. So really it's a love triangle, or love rectangle, not triangle. Um, and then he uh, follows her to her car and gets in with her, which is, uh, fellas, that's not a good way to get to a girl's heart. Just, just throwing that out there. Um, and at first you're thinking oh, okay, he's gonna, like, assault her or something. Well, that's stupid. She's a vampire. She could kick his ass. And then I realized, well, could she? Because, I mean, at this point, we haven't really learned about, about anything vampires can do with their powers, like, other than, you know, form a circle and summon spirits and stuff, but th that's not that interesting. Like, vampires, are they super fast or strong? Like, we, d we don't know at this point. Uh, can they, like, summon fireballs and throw them at people? We don't know at this point. Um... But yeah, he um, brings out a razor blade and he's like, hey, you should drink more of my blood because it's super pleasurable for both sides when they do that. And he cuts himself and lets her drink. Y you would think he would cut himself on his arm or something. No, he fucking takes a razor blade, cuts the side of his neck really deep. I'm like, dude, you could kill yourself doing that. Jeez, just stop being, stop being stupid, okay? Uh, now at this point, Zoe is uh, basically involved with three dudes at once, and she's still constantly referring to other girls as sluts and hoes, which, you know, that's a, another really nice way to treat your main character. Just have her be a massive hypocrite. Um, she d more recaps while she's thinking of cute boys. Um, although at this point, uh, she's preparing to do a magic ritual on the full moon, and she's actually practicing for it. You know, she's practicing magic and everything. It happens off screen, but, you know, we... We, um, it's something, you know, it's better than her just knowing how to do it right away, like she does with most stuff. And then, uh, it's December at this point, so Tulsa gets some snow and everyone's, like, enchanted by it. Wow, that's so crazy, we never get snow around here. But I, that sounded weird to me, so I looked it up. Tulsa gets nine inches of snow a year, and, like, that's not a lot, but still, they shouldn't be, like, enchanted by it. So, Neferet, uh is seen sneaking around by Zoe, and then uh, she speaks to Elliot's ghost, or whatever it is, and Zoe's like, what? That's that's crazy. She sees him too. I wasn't just seeing things. And then he, he like, goes in this trap door that's hidden somewhere on the campus and then leaves. And then just, wh whatever, whatever. So then, um, because she drank Heath's blood, uh, their imprint is now stronger, and when she thinks about him, she can actually see him, 
and she sees him masturbating at one point, because he also senses her there, and... Yeah, whatever. And then, um, Eric does a monologue, because he's an actor, and they all watch it, and, um, Zoe's friend Stevie Ray says, quote, That was so romantic, I almost peed my pants. Who the fuck wrote this? So, they do the ritual, um... Zoe's friends are given elemental affinities, so they all have one for, like, Earth or Fire or whatever. And uh, Neferet takes credit for Zoe's idea to reform the Dark Daughters, and Zoe's kind of upset about that. And the ritual takes a long time. Um, and then, Zoe's friend Stevie Ray uh, dies. Her body rejects the change, and she dies. And it's supposed to be sad, but Zoe's only known her for a month, and she refers to her as her best friend. Um, whatever. And then, um, so Zoe has a vision, uh, of Heath, where more of the ghost zombie things, like Elliot and them, uh, take Heath into the trap door and drag him away. And, um, then the cops come back later and they're like, hey, Heath is missing, what's going on? Well, the fact is I did murder someone last night. I turned into a vampire, it's a long story. And apparently it's forbidden for humans to date vampires. Uh, which is blatantly contradicted later. And then uh, Zoe thinks about how nice uh, Heath is and gets horny over him. And one of the police, while she's talking to him, I should mention, talks about how his sister is a vampire, and he's like, hey, I still love her. And Zoe thinks that's weird, and I'm like, is, is it really weird? You know, I'd like to think that if my sister became a wizard who just didn't like to go out during the daytime, but other than that, her personality remained unchanged. I'd, I'd like to think I'd still love her. So Zoe talks to Heath te telepathically. Um, the zombies drink some of his blood, and uh, she notices that one of them appears to be Stevie Ray, like her ghost or zombie or whatever. And then uh, Zoe goes off to rescue him alone, and she rides a horse there because, of course, she knows how to ride a horse. And she manages to cast a spell which, like, keeps the snow away from her and also manages to cast one that makes her and the horse invisible because she's cool. Uh, and then she manages to get down into the tunnels and she rescues Heath and the other uh, zombie ghost things, including Stevie Ray and Elliot, are just uh, the vampire fledglings who died, except they didn't actually die. They sort of came back and now they're, like, more like traditional vampires. Um, where, like, the sunlight actually will burn them to death if they're, um, if they're not careful and they need to drink human blood a lot in order to not die. We're never really given an explanation as to why these vampires turned like this. Like, at first it seems like, oh, Neferet's up to something, but we're never given a proper explanation. So, um, temper your expectations accordingly. Um, but anyways, uh, while Zoe is down there, she actually manages to use magic in an interesting way, like she shoots some fireballs and stuff, and it's like, hey, that's kind of cool, I wish they did that one and a half books ago, but whatever. <laughs> um, and so Stevie Ray is there, she's kind of alive, and she begs Zoe for death. I'm a vampire! Kill me! Kill me! But Zoe doesn't do it, and then uh, Zoe runs, brings Heath back, and Neferet uh, tries to delete her memory, but apparently Zoe is just so special that it doesn't work. End of book two! There are ten more! So book three, Chosen. Um, Zoe's birthday comes up, and it's apparently on Christmas Eve, so they just talk a lot about um, cr Christmas and her birthday, and about um, celebrating and all that. Zoe's mom is offended, and her stepdad calls her evil, and they send her a birthday card with Jesus being crucified on it. Um, yeah, alright, cool. And then uh, Zoe goes out to see Stevie Ray again, and uh, she sees her eating a homeless person, or not really eating, but like uh, sucking the blood from a homeless person. And Zoe's kind of grossed out, but she's not like shocked or horrified by this, which is weird. Like, again, I'd like to think that if I saw my sister murdering a homeless person, I would feel something about it other than, ew, that's kind of gross, but whatever. She convinces her to meet with uh, clothes, um, by, you know, by offering her clean clothes, because she's been hiding in tunnels forever, so she's all dirty and stuff. So, Zoe and Eric are, like, making out and stuff, she drinks some of his blood, she gets horny, and Lauren, the teacher, sees her, and then, um, Lauren tells her 
okay, they flirt a bunch more, and again, I hate this part, they flirt a bunch more, he tells her it's okay to date, and they kiss, and Zoe talks about how he makes her feel so much more mature than the boys her age do. Gross. And he tries to have sex with her, and Zoe's like, eh, no, I shouldn't. And she's like, I think I'm turning into a hoe. Exact quote, by the way. And again, it's like, you're, you're dating three guys at once. You're, you're a hoe, honey. Stop being hypocritical. Either embrace it and enjoy it, or stop doing it. So, um, after Stevie Ray died, uh, they needed a person to replace her in their circle, so they joined Aphrodite. Um, or so they let Aphrodite join, and Eric is super upset about that. Zoe ignores his feelings because she's a terrible person. Aphrodite finds out about Stevie Ray still being kind of alive, and so she offers up her family's, like, second home as a place where they can meet her. And so, um, Zoe and Aphrodite meet Stevie Ray there, and they manage to get some, like, human blood for her, and some nice clothes and everything so she can wash up and they hide her out there, and at one point Stevie Ray complains about the blood being cold, and they just tell her to microwave it. I've never microwaved blood before, but I don't think that would work very well. One of the professors is uh, killed. In fact, it's the professor of, like, magic and everything that Zoe was gonna go to to see if she could find a way to save Stevie Ray, and she's actually mutilated. Uh, like, her head is cut off, and she's crucified uh, on campus. And they leave a note there, which is uh, Exodus 22, 18, uh, which is, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, which, fun fact, by the way, uh, when looking at the Bible, or any historical document, really, you have to take into consideration the context in which it was written, and in Greek, the word for witch is also the same as female poisoner. So, you have to wonder, people living out in the desert, what would they be more worried about? Would they be worried about the woman who lives on the edge of town and mixes up herbs that help with your headaches? Or would they be worried about someone poisoning their only source of water? So just... You know, the Bible doesn't actually hate witches that much. It's just kind of an interesting fact. But, you know, anyways, uh, they bring in a bunch of vampire warriors who, I, I guess they're useful? I, I don't know. Like, they use swords and shit, so like... I, I feel like I could take them all out with a gun, but, you know... Whatever, so, what, anyways, the professor is killed, and they assume humans did it. Knowing that there's all this danger, Zoe decides to go out and go see Heath again. Uh, she thinks about boys, she drinks some of his blood, and then these uh, two black guys show up and harass them. And I mention that they're black guys because the book really goes out of its way to let us know that they're black. Like, it talks about how their genes are sagging, and they're talking about how... Hey, white girl, that white boy can't do that for you. Whatever. Um, and then she hits them with a blast of wind, which sends them in front of a truck, and they get hit by. And um, I think they're killed, but we never really... We, we never get a confirmation of that. So Eric um, completes his transformation into a full vampire, because I guess that, that's just how it happens now. Zoe is kind of upset about this, and for whatever reason, and then she goes to Lauren, and then they have sex, again, gross, and uh, by doing this, uh, or when doing this, uh, she drinks his blood, which imprints on him, and breaks the bond with Heath, which is very painful for both of them, and then um, Eric sees them right after they have sex, um, and then he breaks up with Zoe, uh, which is fair. So then Zoe is upset by this, and then she goes off and overhears Lauren talking with Neferet, and apparently Neferet told him specifically to seduce Zo Zoe so that it would uh, make her friends angry at her and isolate her more. Then Zoe tells all her friends about Stevie Ray still being alive, they try to learn things to help her, and they manage to heal her through the power of friendship and by just being that special, I guess. Um, but when they make the circle, uh, Stevie Ray drinks some of Aphrodite's blood, and afterwards her mark disappears, and they're like, wait, is she no longer a vampire? And she runs off. And then um, Lauren shows up dead, mutilated the same way the other professor was, and it's clear Neferet killed him, and then she declares war on humans. End of book three. Book four, Untamed. Aphrodite shows up. She's human now. We get a recap. Um, other more important vampires than Neferet show up, like the leaders of the High Council of Vampires and all that. They show up, and uh, they put down the shield that she had put up to prevent people from coming or going without her knowing. 
Uh, so that whole thing was pointless, and they tell her, you can't declare war on humans. Aphrodite has visions of Zoe's death. If she lives, there's no war. Um, they summon Nyx, and Nyx tells them vague things. She's not helpful at all. Uh, they meet with the High Priestess, who I'm not even gonna name because she's not important. She mentions that she doesn't want a war, and because the last time that happened we had the Salem burnings of vampires, which, again, vampires are just witches in this, whatever. So Heath is angry at Zoe, again, totally reasonable, because, like, she broke their bond, which was super painful for him, and she didn't contact him afterwards, so he specifically says he thought she was dead, and he had no way of knowing. So, yeah, that's a shitty thing to do. And then, um, Eric is now the professor of acting at their school or whatever, and, uh, she does Shakespearean improv with him, which I, I have never heard of that, um, it, I, and I mean, I'm not, like, a super big actor or anything, but, like, I did do theater in high school, so, whatever, whatever, I, I've, I've just never heard of that, and then, um, it, it's a scene from Othello, and then they kiss, and he chokes her, which, consent, if it's consensual, it's fine, but, like, the fact that it's not is weird, and do I have enough battery power to even keep doing this? Yeah, I got, I got time, I got time. So, um, yeah, he doesn't forgive her, but they're on the road to forgiveness now. So Aphrodite, uh, despite being a human, still has visions. And so she has vision, a vision of uh, Zoe's grandmother, again, doing things, and she's, like, holding a poem. And apparently, um, the poem mentions that there are, like, evil spirits and angels and stuff. And, okay, so after a little while... Uh, while discussing this and everything, they discovered that the poem they saw was a prophecy. So they saw a vision of the future, and in that vision of the future there was a prophecy which they used to discover what's going to happen in the future. Why not just use the prophecy on its own? Like, okay, we, we find out later that there is actually a character who writes poetry, and her poetry is, um, like, it predicts the future. And she's not that important, so I'm not going to really bring her up again, but we find out that she predicts the future through poetry. Why not just find one of her poems in the regular world? Or better yet, just have Aphrodite, like, say something, say, say a prophecy, like the Oracle in, uh, like, Percy Jackson, for example. That's a good series that uh, deals with prophecy well, because for the most part, I don't like visions of the future in stories. They're, they don't work that well, but uh, Percy Jackson, it works well because Rick Riordan, or Riordan, I'm, I'm still not sure how to say his name, I'm sorry. But he understood how uh, ancient Greek tragedies used them. And so, in the first book, for example, uh, he's told that, Percy is told that he'll go west and face the god who has turned, and that he'll be betrayed by the one who calls him a friend. And so, throughout the whole book, you're assuming that the god who has turned is Hades, because they think Hades stole Zeus's master bolt, but it turns out Ares actually stole it. So they're like, oh, okay, so the prophecy was right, we just interpreted it wrong. And throughout the whole book, you're thinking either Grover or Annabeth is going to somehow betray him, but then it turns out to be another one of his friends named Luke. He's the one that betrays him, and so again, the prophecy was right, we just interpreted it wrong. And so it works really well there. In this, the visions and prophecies, half the time they'd never lead anywhere, and in this case, it's just brought about so clumsily, like, my god. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this whole long backstory, but basically, there was this sort of fallen angel or god uh, character named Kelowna, who lived uh, among the Cherokee for a while, and as a god, he raped a whole bunch of women, and uh, the children of their offspring became these raven demon things, they're like part raven, part demon, and, um, they they discover, like, okay, we think Neferet's gonna try and bring Kelowna back, because he was imprisoned in the Earth a long time ago. And uh, Zoe is attacked by one of these demons and is protected, so she's like, oh, shit, that's crazy. Um, she argues with Eric, and she talks about how we need to forgive each other. No, you don't. Uh, Eric needs to forgive you. Like, okay, cheating on someone is obviously a big deal in a relationship, and... It's different for everybody. Like, if uh, Eric decides that he can go past that and continue with Zoe, then he can do that, and maybe their relationship will be stronger because of it. But if he decides he can't, well, then he can't. Like, there's nothing he did wrong here at all. Like, not even in the smaller bits that I skipped over. He's just a dude who got screwed over. Yeah, so Zoe's, Zoe's a bitch, and I hate her. 
So, yeah, Zoe's grandma gets in a car crash uh, because a demon crashes into her windshield, and she goes into a coma, and th that that's it for her for a while. And what they plan to do is do a ritual, and then they're going to have Stevie Ray come out and take a place in the circle, and everyone's going to be like, what, Stevie Ray, you're alive? And um, apparently, uh, so what they call her the fledglings that died and then come back, They're, they refer to them as red fledglings or red vampires. Like, Stevie Ray, I think, is a full red vampire. And, like I said, they're like traditional vampires where the sun will actually burn them and they need to drink blood more often. Um, and they're just gonna announce at the ritual to everybody, hey, these are real, so that people know. And so they plan for another ritual because they don't do anything else. So, at the beginning of this book, um, the love rectangle turns into a love pentagon because this new guy named Stark enters the picture and he's like just an older vampire fledgling who Zoe sees and thinks is super cute and um, he just gives her... They, they have this um, brief meeting where Zoe says like she feels a connection with him and she thinks he might be... she thinks he might be her soulmate and all that. No, I'm not talking about fairy tale love. I mean, I'm talking about a mature relationship. And he gives her his whole tragic backstory about how he has uncontrollable powers and accidentally killed his mentor and all that. And then he dies because um, his body rejects the change. And she's sad, but she thinks he might come back. And during the ritual where Stevie Ray and them are, he comes back. And Neferet blames Zoe for it. She's like, oh, he's supposed to be dead. You're doing evil magic. And um, yeah, cool, whatever. Uh, so Neferet sort of takes over the circle and summons the demons and releases Kelowna and um, they go out and start, you know, attacking the city and they mention that there are fires and they can hear gunshots and stuff. And I'm making that sound kind of exciting because you're thinking, oh wow, the world's actually getting destroyed. It's not, don't worry, it, it means nothing by the next book. But um, they decide, uh, like Zoe and some of her friends decide, uh, we need to run off into the tunnels because we'll be safe down there with the rest of the red fledglings. And Zoe specifically says at one point that, um, I wasn't sure how we survived. It must have been because Nyx liked us. Or, that's not verbatim, but she basically says, we survived because Nyx. Like, that's a very unsatisfying way to end your action scene, but whatever. And, uh, so, yeah, while she's down there, she calls, uh, her Heath, and she calls her mom, and she tells him, hey, demons are out there wrecking shit. We're, we need to... You need to run. That's basically... That, that's, the, that's the gist of it. And then, so they're down there, and they're like, okay, we need to make a plan so we can go kill bad guys. End of book four. We're only a third of the way through this, and they have only just recently brought up who the main antagonist is supposed to be. So, book five, Hunted. We start with a dream, which is, you know, the best way to start off your story with something that has no stakes and is just there for clunky exposition. So, um, apparently Kelowna is there and he talks to Zoe a little bit. He wants her as a wife and she's horny for him because this love pentagon needs to become a love hexagon. And, um, okay, so he refers to her as uh, Aya, which is the name of this artificial girl made of clay and enchanted that the Cherokee made in order to trap him in the earth. And so he thinks that she's the reincarnation of her, and it's confirmed later, yeah, she is, because I guess reincarnation works in this world, or exists in this world, whatever. I don't, I don't care anymore. We get recap. Um, Stevie Ray uh, got shot with an arrow during the battle at the end there. It was fired by Stark, by the way. I don't think you care. Um, and they managed to save her life uh, and heal the wound, sort of, and they're hiding in the tunnels. And apparently at some point, uh, because Stevie Ray drank Aphrodite's blood, they're imprinted now. Alright, and the red vampires are mad at Zoe because they killed one of them. Alright. Um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over a bunch of stuff, because like, a third of this book is just them in the tunnels, and it's just, it's in like three different rooms. So it's people arguing, whatever. And apparently, um, all the demon destruction and everything above ground settled down after a while, and so the human news stations report that it was, like, some sort of gang activity, and it's just like, what? What? What the fuck? 
Like, I'm not saying there's no gangs in Tulsa. I'm sure there are, but, like... Are, are there any that could destroy, like, half the city? I, I'm really asking. So, remember how fledglings need to be near full vampires or they'll die? Well, Zoe gets cut by a demon and her wound is pretty bad and they managed to stabilize it, but, like, she used up a bunch of her spirit energy or whatever, um, healing, and so she's gonna die if she's not around more full vampires. And even though there's one with them, that's not enough. So there's like, okay, we're gonna have to go back to the House of Night, and so they go back, and uh, Kelowna and Neff are running things, and they're being super authoritarian about it, and the demon ravens are around watching everything that people do, and um, so the cliffhanger ending of the last book changed basically nothing, whatever. And so Zoe heals, and um, Kelowna wants to make Zoe evil, so that she'll be his wife properly, and Zoe is surprised that he's evil, because after hearing a story where he's literally raped dozens or hundreds of women, she thinks he might just be misunderstood or whatever. Zoe does some more magic stuff, and it's mentioned that she gets tired when she does it, which is the first point in this entire series where there's any sort of cost for magic, so... You know, point in this book's favor, I guess. And then uh, they see Stark, who is, now he's like a red vampire thing, like, uh, but he's under the control of Kelowna, sort of. And she sees him try to rape a girl, but she still loves him, I guess. And, um, yeah, whatever. So it, it, we, we discover that the Neferet and Kelowna's plan is to, because they actually killed the um, high priestess of all the vampires, uh, at the end of the last book during the ritual. So their plan is to uh, call an election and bring them all together, and then they're going to proclaim that uh, Neferet is the avatar of Nyx on this world, and that Kelowna is uh, Erebus, or, who is the um, consort of Neferet, you know, he's her husband, and then they're going to get her to elect Neferet uh, the leader of all the vampires, like the Queen of the Damned or whatever. I'm sorry I'm moving around so much, but the, like my leg muscles are cramping up. Like I said, I only slept like three hours last night, and I stayed awake until 6 a.m. finishing this, so, you know, it's, um... Yeah, whatever. So, basically, Zoe, um, sleeps with Stark, but when I say sleeps with him, I, I mean, they don't have sex, but, like, they sleep in the same bed for... It's not important why. And then he swears an oath to her, uh, which apparently breaks his connection to Kelowna, and then he becomes like a full red vampire, and he's like, wow, I'm a good guy now, because that that's how being good and evil works, you know? And um, they mention killing Neferet in order to help things, and Zoe decides, no, I don't, I don't want to kill Neferet, because even though she's killed a bunch of people and stuff, this is why all the fantasy adventure stuff, such as it is, in the story just doesn't fit with all the high school drama and romance stuff. Like, we, we have this character, Zoe, who might have been fine in a high school drama, soap opera, whatever you want to call it, and, you know, she might have been a good character or a bad one, but she would have worked okay in that story, but in this one where she's supposed to be, like, trying to save the world and stuff, and she's just straight up saying, no, I don't want to kill Neferet, and there's no real reason for it other than she doesn't want to. Y you know, like, it's not that she doesn't want to kill anybody because she killed one of the uh, kids in the tunnels, and at other points she kills a couple of people. It's just, no, I don't want to kill Neferet, and there's no real reason for it. It just, it, so it doesn't work. Anyways... Uh, they set a fire to at the House of Night to distract people, and then they escape to a church, which is apparently a, on, built on a spot that has a bunch of power in it, and then uh, her grandmother is alive and comes there, and then they do another circle ritual, because that's, that's, that's how all these books end, I swear. They do the ritual really good, and then they banish Neferet and Kelowna and imprison them back in the earth. And you might be thinking, well, that sounds fine, you know, that, that's a shitty ending to a shitty series, but, like, it's an ending. There's seven books left, guys. Book six, Tempted. So this is the first one where we have multiple POVs. Like, the majority of it is still told from Zoe's first-person perspective, but we, um, 
get some third person following other characters around. And that's even worse than just having multiple characters in first person, because... And, and even then, I don't like multiple characters in first person very much. The only time I've seen that work pretty well was in The Young World, because that series, while it did have some pretty serious issues, uh, all of the POV characters had very distinct voices, and it worked really, really well to uh, show off their personalities. Whereas in this, it switches between Zoe's narration, which doesn't have a whole lot of personality, and third-person narration, which doesn't have a whole lot of personality, and it just creates this weird uh, dichotomy where you're like, well, how does... How is she telling her story? Like, you're not supposed to think about that too much. Like, you might be thinking, okay, there's a chip in their head recording everything, or you might be thinking, okay, this is a journal that they wrote down afterwards. But when it switches between that and third person, it, it just feels weird. There are uh, creepy tunnels, and they think, like, Kelowna's still around, and they're thinking, like, yeah, he's still gonna break out at some point, and the demons are still wandering around, so we gotta you know, prepare, which is fine. And at one point they mention that they're watching The Sound of Music, which makes me wonder, are, were, were there vampire Nazis? Or would they be Nazi vampires? I, I don't know. I, I, mean, I mean, there were Nazi vampires in Helsing and in Blood Rain, so, I, but those are much cooler than this, so... I, I don't know. Just a thought I had. So anyways, uh, Stevie Ray finds one of the demons with a broken wing, and she can't bring herself to kill him, so she hides him away and helps him heal, and because whatever. And it's very clear at this point that there's going to be a romance there because there's no other relationship for characters to have. So Zoe and Eric break up for real, for real this time, uh, because she cheats on him, and uh, she's like still super into Stark at this point, and I'm not really spoiling anything by saying that Stark is like the one that she winds up choosing out of this love hexagon. Or, hell, you could say heptagon if you want to count Kelowna in there. That's, you know, whatever. So, um, Aphrodite has a vision of Zoe killing Kelowna, but then she also has a vision of her ruling by his side and being evil. Uh, Zoe helps heal some people, um, the other uh, crazy red fledglings are choosing to side with Kelowna and Neferet because they're just evil. You know, they, they don't want to side with the good guys. Uh, and they kind of attack Stevie Ray, and they kind of attack um, the the demon. His, his name is Refraim, I think, or Refim. I don't know. I didn't write it down because I didn't think it would be important, and then after a while I just decided it wasn't. Uh, and it's not, actually. It's, it's not. Um, I, I might cut that part out. Who knows? So, they're thinking that Kelowna's still around, and so... So, uh, according to Aphrodite's visions, using some clues from that, they discover that Kelowna is in Italy, which, okay, that's fine. Uh, but then they check Twitter, and apparently it's confirmed that, yeah, him and Nefred are in Italy, and I'm like, what, what, what? Like, okay, first off, how did you escape your prison? And second off, how did you... Why not just have them mention it on Twitter or on the news or something? Why why bring in the visions if you're... Yeah, okay. And we find out, like, the one little interesting bit of information in, in this whole series. Like, the one little interesting bit of lore is that Kelowna used to be Nyx's oath-sworn warrior, um but then his heart got broken because she didn't love him properly, and so she cast him down to Earth, and so, you know, fallen angel uh, imagery and all that, which is not super cool, but whatever. So uh, the evil red fledglings, or red vampires, whatever, uh, try to kill Stevie Ray by locking her in this area where the sun will hit her, and uh, she's with, there with Refraim, Refraim the demon, uh, and he sort of shields her from the sun, and he's like, hey, come on, get us out of here, with, with his wings, you know, like, oof, over some... That, that must have looked stupid if you didn't know what I was doing, but whatever. He um, heals her, or not heals her, she shields her, and then they wind up imprinting because... Yeah, cool. And then that breaks her imprint with Aphrodite because, you know, that didn't go anywhere, so we might as well get rid of it. And then Zoe, back in Italy, sees the Vampire Council... And then she tells everybody, hey, Neferet and Kelowna are evil, we can't uh, be doing this. And they're like, hmm, that's, uh, that, that's interesting, we'll consider, we'll consider what you're saying. 
And then um, she goes off and sees, or excuse me, uh, Kelowna and Neferet are off in this meadow doing something, and Heath sees them, and he's like, hey, they're up to something bad, and he tries to tell Zoe, hey, something bad's happening, and then um, they, she goes and runs to get him, and then uh, Kelowna kills Heath, and Zoe, in her uh, grief, I guess, throws her spirit at Kelowna, but it shatters, and so her body, she's not dead, but her spirit goes to the other world, and her body is just basically comatose on the earth, like it, it's in a vegetative state, and this might have worked okay, but they've never brought up like the other world or anything like that before. Um, so, you know, there's that. And that's the end of book six, so book seven, Burned. These titles are really stupid. God, I just got... Okay, um, so apparently there's a vampire queen, and nothing was... Like, that was not mentioned before, so whatever. Oh yeah, I should also mention that um, book seven onwards, I read these all in the last 24 hours to just give you an idea of the craziness I'm dealing with right now. So apparently there's a vampire queen. Um, they bring Zoe's body to the queen's isle, um, and they're able to do that because apparently Stark is uh, related to the queen's uh, guardian. So, uh, he goes on, like, this spirit quest, basically, and he kills his evil self and becomes a shaman, and then he's able to go to the other world. Um, again, none of this was brought up before, so it just kind of comes out of nowhere, and honestly, killing your evil self in a vision is, like, the dumbest, cheesiest thing you could possibly throw in a story like this, but, you know, it happens. And then, uh, in the other world, Heath basically, he fades away, and at first I was thinking, oh, okay, he's dead for real, like, his spirit passed on to whatever the beyond is. Um, but don't worry, we'll deal with that later. And then, um, Stark fights Kelowna in an arena in the other world, because I, I don't know why Kelowna would bother fighting fair. Um, and then he dies, and then Kelowna decides to share his immortality with Stark to bring him back to life. I know this sounds like I'm doing it really fast, but the book does it really fast, too. And uh, by sharing his immortality with him, Kelowna is no longer immortal, and apparently he was... Like, we, I was thinking Neferet was his subordinate, but no, he's Neferet's bitch. Like, he swore an oath to her at some point. Uh, but by sharing his immortality, the terms of the oath are broken, so Neferet just banishes all of them. Yeah, so also, um, while all this is going on, Stevie Ray back in Oklahoma is doing her thing, and, um, she, man, she invokes this, um, white bull by mistake. And apparently, in this world, there's the darkness and the light. And the darkness is represented by the white bull, and the light is represented by the black bull, because light isn't always good and dark isn't always bad, because this series is hashtag deep. And, um, anyways, um, Stevie Ray accidentally invokes the evil white bull and winds up being helped by the black bull, which is light. I don't know, they talk about how the red vampires have to accept either the dark or the light, because again, hashtag deep, and Stevie Ray uh, is now like officially in love with the demon Rafame, um, but uh, he, he senses that his father is back in our world, and he's like, I, I'm sorry, but I need to go to my father, and basically that's the end of book seven. Book eight, Awakened! Oh my god, They're, these are still going. So Zoe and Stark fuck under a tree, because... I don't, I don't know who got the idea that having sex under a tree is romantic, but I've seen it a lot. And not in real life, but like in shit like this, I've seen a lot. And I'm like, have any of you had sex under a tree before? If so, was it any good? I, I don't know, but... So, yeah, after going to the other world and everything, Zoe can now use uh, the old fey magic, which, again, never mentioned before. Nothing in this book is e in these books is ever mentioned before it becomes necessary to the story. And quite frankly, I don't think the authors knew where they were going with this uh, at all. Like, okay, so not having the whole thing planned out from book one is acceptable. Like, you know, you're going to run into some issues with it, a la the game, uh, A Song of Ice and Fire by George W. R. Martin, but, like, it's an acceptable way to work. This one, I feel like they didn't know what they were doing from page to page, and they never bothered editing. And, actually, several of these books were released two in one year, so, 
you know, just keep that in mind as, as we're reading this. Like, this might be why it's such a mess. So anyways, uh, Zoe, because she can use old fey magic, uh, the Vampire Queen uh, talks to her and she's like, you know, you're so special and cool, I want you to be the next queen after I die, because she's just so special. Uh, and then they can sense the darkness coming back in Oklahoma, so Zoe goes back to Oklahoma. And um, Kelowna can enter Stark's mind uh, because he, you know, he gave him part of his immortality, so they're connected now. Um, I don't know how a god was bound by an oath to Neferet in the first place, but... Like, maybe he's not a god so much as he is just a really powerful being, kind of like in uh, God of War, you know, where they're just... I, I don't know, that... This series does not give nearly enough info to have any sort of fan theories at all. And so when they get there, Neferet is there, and she's, like, still the in charge of the House of Night, and she publicly apologizes for everything, and she's like, hey, I'm, I'm sorry I'm evil, but I won't do it again. And Zoe knows it's a lie, but she goes along with it so that she can bide her time. Which, like, okay, I, I get how Zoe would, would do that, that makes sense, but, like, why would the others go along if Neferet is just... If, she, if she's just evil and they've seen evidence of it, why would they go along with it? Like, um... Yeah, okay, so Neferet, um, six some guards on them, they fight with a circle, obviously. So, the, the demon Raphaim, Stevie Ray's raven boyfriend, um, comes along and fights during all this, and he decides, you know what, I'm gonna fight with my friends and not be evil. Uh, and so Nyx decides to um, put, like, a curse? I don't know if a curse would be the right word, but she puts something on him so that uh, in order to punish him for his crimes, he is a uh, raven during the day, uh, but then at night he becomes a human. So, like, I guess that's a punishment, sure, but, like, it doesn't sound that bad all that, really. Yeah, and so Zoe and company start a new House of Night in the tunnels. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But the, um, the really, the really crazy thing that happens at the end of this book is, um, okay. Okay, so Neferet gets Zoe's mom, who has not been around for a while, but, you know, apparently she left her stepdad, too, which is alright, uh, and she kills Zoe's mom, and then she summons Heath's spirit from the beyond, and I know what you're thinking, I know what you're thinking. Did Neferet put Heath's soul, Zoe's ex-boyfriend's soul, into her mom's body? <laughs> sort of. Uh, unfortunately, he doesn't come back just as her mom. He comes back in a sort of different body, uh, and we'll get more into that later, but his name is Orox, which is spelled with an X because it's cool, like, cooler, I guess. Whatever, that's how book eight ends. Book nine, Destined. We're getting there, we're getting there. Um, so Heath, like I said, is now Orox, and he kind of knows he's Heath, but kind of doesn't. And um, Neferet wants to use him in order to kill darkness, remember the white bull, because deep, uh, and become a goddess. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, Orox, uh, fights a demon, and while he's fighting, he half-shifts into a bull, because he's a werebull now. Get it? Because Orox, haha, -ha, I, I couldn't figure it out from the name. And he's basically just a, a bad boy, you know, because they needed to add another love interest for Zoe, and they're, you know, talking about stuff, and... She's like, oh, my mom's dead, I'm sad, and Orox is nice to her. Um, Jesus Christ. So Kelowna decides to call a truce between everybody, even though there already kind of was a truce, because, you know, they just kind of set up their own house of night, and whatever. And then they get a prophecy of Refim's death, Demon Boy's death, and um, they, you know, they do this whole ritual, again, ritual circles for use for fucking everything in this series, and it reveals how Zoe's mom died, and now they have, like, definitive proof that, hey, Neferet's evil, even though they kind of already had proof that Neferet's evil, whatever. And uh, then uh, the new priestess that showed them all this uh, kind of chases Neferet away, and she runs off, shaking her fist, I'll get you one day. And uh, her name is Thanatos, by the way, the new priestess. And she becomes the new leader of this House of Night, and Kelowna pledges to her, and end of book nine. Book 10, Hidden. This one is probably the most pointless, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of filler in this series, like people breaking up and getting back together and then dying and then coming back to life, and uh, people who 
minor characters we don't care about and their romantic exploits and all that. Like, there's a lot of filler in this series, but book 10 is the, the most pointless. Like, Kelowna really is good now. Uh, Zoe's grandma gets kidnapped and then they save her. And um, the vampire council, when they exile ne Neferet officially, she turns into a whole mess of spiders and runs away. It's I, I didn't know her powers could do that, but, you know, that's not important. And then they learn that Aurochs is Heath, or sort of Heath. End of book 10. Book 11 revealed. We're almost there. So it starts with the House of Night having an uh, open house uh, where they, like, invite the humans in and they do, like, you know, they have booths set up. Like, here's food and here's crafts and all that. Neferet appears as a ghost. She says some evil stuff. They defeat her with a circle. That's all you have to do! You know... Would it kill you to mix it up a little? Like, r really, would it, would it kill you to mix it up a little? Like, we, <clears throat> we know at least Zoe can shoot fireballs and do magic stuff. Why not just have the vampires do stuff like that? <clears throat> Once in a while. I'm dying. <clears throat> I'm no longer dying. So, Aphrodite's dad, who, remember, is the mayor of Tulsa, is killed, and Aphrodite's mom is really upset about it, and Aphrodite is really upset about it, which is, um... Honestly, pretty reasonable. Like, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but Aphrodite is the one character in this whole series that, even though I didn't like her that much, she has a little bit of personality to her. Or rather, her and Zoe are the only ones that have a little bit of personality and a little bit of depth and a little bit of complexity. So, <clears throat> Aphrodite, despite having a super complex relationship with her dad and not liking him all that much, is still super upset when he dies. And... Well, that was, that was something. You know, it was like 3 in the morning when I read that, so... Or actually, before 3 in the morning, but whatever. It was late when I read that, so wh whatever. So, Zoe um, <clears throat> accidentally drinks some of Aurochs' blood. Remember, Aurochs is Heath as a werewolf. Um, <clears throat> and her powers are kind of going out of control, and she accidentally kills two homeless people, and um, I, I just feel like this series hates homeless people at this point, because... You know, Stevie Ray and the Red Vamps were killing homeless people for food for a while, and then Zoe kills two homeless people. But throughout all of this, it's kind of like, eh, it's it's fine. You know, they're not evil anymore. But, like, you still, you still did evil shit. Like, you should have to face some consequences for that, I feel. So, Zoe uh, turns herself into the police, uh, and uh, cool. And while all of this is going on, uh, ne it keeps cutting to Neferet. And as she's, like, you know, preparing to become super powerful and all that, we get her backstory. It's not interesting, so I don't know why they bothered putting it in. Like, it, it's not even, like, uh, <clears throat> the villain from Throne of Glass, whose name I already forgot, by the way, but, you know, she was, like, actually a demon who was just pretending to be the Fairy Queen. That was kind of interesting, but this is not. Anyways, it ends with Neferet massacring a church and coming into her full power, which is, okay, cool, I, I just don't care, you know? <laughs> at least, at least be crazy again. You know, at, at least do some more stuff where you put boyfriend's dead souls into mom's bodies, and then, whatever, it's over. Book 12, Redeemed, we are in the home stretch. This is the last one. <clears throat> that name, Redeemed, is pretty ironic, just gotta say. Zoe's name is cleared, um, which is weird because she actually did kill the two homeless guys, even if it's an accident, that's still illegal. <clears throat> but her grandmother cleanses her soul, alright, whatever, and then Neferet takes over a hotel and enthralls the humans that are there so that they'll worship her like a goddess, and um, apparently only Zoe can defeat Neferet using the old fey magic, um, alright. So they cast another circle spell, and it basically just makes a barrier around the hotel so Neferet is trapped in there. And there's like 12 POVs throughout all of this, which I think is trying to make it sound epic, because it's supposed to be like this big fate of the world uh, battle. It all takes place in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and there's really not that much fighting throughout, so... The, yeah, the, the multiple POVs really aren't necessary, and uh, most of the characters, when... I got to their POV, I seriously forgot who they were, and I was just like, yeah, whatever, they're doing things. I, I just I just needed to get it done. And I know I said I wouldn't be reading any more terrible lines, because 
Quite frankly, I want you to be able to go through this series and find some for yourself, but at one point, Aphrodite is, like, making out with her boyfriend because, you know, everybody needs to be paired off in some way in this series, otherwise they're not a complete human, and she says to Zoe, quote, Seriously, Z, you've got to stop the whole coitus interruptus thing. It's getting on my nerves. Stevie Ray is supposed to say the dumb lines. Uh, in order to lure Colonna out, uh, Neferet starts throwing people off the balcony, and when he sees that, he goes in and flies in to save them, and then she shoots him with magic bullets, and he... Uh, well, he, d he dies, but he doesn't die right away. He has this long, prolonged death with, uh, his girlfriend, uh, Thanatos, because, you know, I was so invested in their relationship, ooh, and... I totally care about Kelowna, who is, was the villain and got redeemed for really no reason. Ooh. And Anyways, um, Neferet manages to break the spell that's holding her prisoner, and Orox dies fighting some demons. Again, I don't care because he's already died once. Uh, so Z and company defeat Neferet. You'll never guess how they do it. No, really, you will, you will never, ever ever guess. Did you guess that they beat her using a ritual circle? Well, there's no prize. Yes, they beat her using a ritual circle. And then she's like banished slash killed slash I don't give a shit. And everyone transforms into full vampires. Cool. Um, that's... Yeah, okay, and then Zoe and all her friends become council members running this House of Night, even though there's, like, a whole bunch of Houses of Night out there, so it's really not that impressive. It's like, it's like if you defeated the President in a sword fight on top of the Pentagon, and then your reward for doing that was you got to be mayor of Pueblo, Colorado. Like, that's, that's not that impressive at that point, but, uh, whatever, and then... In the epilogue, we see that Orox's spirit, which is really Heath's spirit, I feel, but he hasn't been Heath for, like, five books, whatever. Uh, his spirit ascends to the beyond, and he gets to meet with Nyx, and that's... That is the end. Um, what was this? Okay, I mean, I know this started as high school drama with a little bit of Harry Potter thrown in, and it was a super big ripoff of Harry Potter with, like, not even doing... <clears throat> <clears throat> not even doing the elements that made Harry Potter good well. Like, it's just, yeah, there's magic, and you're, you're at school, and there's houses, but we're not gonna make any of that important. I'm sorry, my leg is really itchy right now. But, um, it, it just went insane after a while. And don't get me wrong, some of that insanity is really funny, but, um, it, it just went really off the rails. If there even were any rails. Um, but the main thing with this series that I have a problem with is that everything is solved too easy. Okay, I know that, like, nothing is brought up until the exact moment it's needed, like, I've mentioned that a little bit, but you really have no idea uh, how often that happens. It happens two or three times in every book, and I, I just wouldn't have time to mention all of it. Like, I've been filming almost two hours already, and I, I didn't touch on anywhere near all the stuff I could have. There's so much wrong with this series. And, you know, everything being solved with just a circle, which is basically just a glorified way of saying the power of friendship. It really is. But everything being solved that same way is remarkably unsatisfying. Like, remarkably. You know, if, if they had had the characters um, fighting individually and they only use circles occasionally for special things, uh, like, you know, people were throwing fireballs, and people were transforming into bulls, and people were transforming into, uh, clouds of bats. Like, that would be cool. You know, that would be a cool thing to put in a fantasy adventure story. And if you just wanted to write, like, high school romance and all that, then whatever, that's fine. But don't throw in all of these, these demons and all this rape and murder and stuff. Like, God. Beyond the plot being absolute dog shit, uh... No characters have any personality other than they're good or they're bad, and they love X. Because remember, every character needs to be in a relationship except the bad guys, and once the bad guys get into a relationship, that means they're no longer bad guys. But n no characters have any personality beyond that. And um, Zoe and Aphrodite were the exceptions, because Zoe 
you know, let's talk about Aphrodite first. Aphrodite is interesting, and she's complex. You know, she had these parents who were super wealthy, but they raised her with ridiculous standards, and they straight up tell her to do pretty nasty stuff, and to the point where she becomes a basically a sociopath uh, by the time she's a teenager. But over the course of the story, she realizes, okay, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't want to be a bad person anymore, and she becomes better. Um, and throughout all of this, she still is kind of a bitch when she talks to people. Like, you know, she talks down to people, she treats them as less than, that sort of thing. And it, um, she's not a likable character, I, I should say that. Like, she's interesting and has multiple facets to her, but she's not likable. On one hand, that her unlikable unlikability makes her more interesting because it's kind of like she's saying, "Yeah, I'm I'm a bitch. Like, take it or leave it. That's that's who I am." So, I guess some people might get something out of that, but I didn't. And Zoe is much much worse, much worse. Okay, she's special just because. Okay, she's shallow. Okay, she falls in love with dudes uh, just because they're hot and they make her horny. Uh, she's a total hypocrite. She's constantly referring to other girls as sluts and hoes while also being involved with multiple dudes at once. And, like, again, if you just want to be involved with multiple dudes at once, like, I'm not going to stop you. You live your life, okay? But just stop being such a hypocrite about it. Stop judging other people for it. Uh, she has no goals at all throughout the story. Like, it's just, at the beginning of the story, she's just a teenager. What does she want to do with her life? Uh, they mentioned she wants to be a veterinarian at a couple of points, but that gets thrown out the window, and it really has nothing to do with the story at large. You know, like, if this had been a story about her wanting to become High Priestess or something, that that maybe could have worked, but it, it, uh, it, it, it's not about that. It's just, oh, there's bad guys, let's go fight the bad guys. So, she has very little personality other than being a hypocritical bitch, and she's just, again, total Mary Sue. I hate using that because it's overused, but that's the best word I can think of uh, to describe her. Like, this whole story is built around showing off how cool and how special Zoe is, and she doesn't work for any of that. So, um, yeah, there's that. Um, and the plot, the plot goes all over the place, but it never manages to escalate. You know, you know what I mean? Like, the first uh, two books, let's say, were basically just high school drama. But then after that, it's like, oh, okay, people are dying and we need to save them. Which is um, not particularly interesting, but that's just the way they handled it is not particularly interesting. And then they're like, oh, okay, demon lord fallen angel god thing is gonna come back. Let's... we, we gotta stop him and Neferet. And... And pretty much every book ends with them setting the bad guys back. Like, you know, they, they beat them, just not permanently, so it never manages to escalate. The prose, like I've mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's really bad. You know, the few little excerpts I gave you should have given you an idea. And, like, it's funny, but it's really bad. And I feel like this book was trying to go for some sort of girl power fantasy, but it, uh, it, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do that at all. Like, they, the vampires are matriarchal. Uh, cool, but they don't really do anything with that, and they don't really show off how cool and special girls are. Um, all right. The technology and the cultural references are kind of all over the place, because, like I said, the first book came out in 2007, and the last one was in 2014. And they take place over the course of only a couple of months, though. And so when they mention at the beginning that they're using, like, old-school flip phones for cell phones, that makes sense, but then by the end they're using, like, smartphones and tablets, and uh, they're mentioning Game of Thrones and stuff, like, it's just... it's just sloppy. This series does not feel like it was edited at all. It really doesn't. And maybe that's just because uh, the two authors, PC Cast and Kristen Cast, uh, PC Cast wrote it, and Kristen Cast is her daughter, and she was the editor, so that might have had something to do with it, but I seriously don't know. We're, we're just about done here. I just wanted to say that House of Night is now the worst series I've ever read. Like, the, the absolute worst. It's worse than Elixir, because other bad series that I've read on here, like Elixir and Throne of Glass, 
those could imaginally be salvaged. Like, th Elixir, you could keep the same basic idea for a story, and as long as you changed, well, let's face it, everything about the execution, it would be a decent story, but it would, uh, well, it, it would still be recognizable. You know, you know what I mean? Like, it would still be, oh, okay, this was the original idea, let's, let's go with that. And whereas with House of Night, if you were to change it to make it good, it would be totally unrecognizable by the end. It would, it would be a different story altogether. So th there's nothing good here. There's nothing at all. And as bad as Elixir was, it was also mercifully short. This one was not. This one was really long, and the insanity, just all the different directions it went in, th this book, feel, <laughs> this series feels like a, f a child's fever dream which they then tried to tell to somebody else, and then that somebody else wrote it down. Because this just goes all over the place. And so, that's why I have to say, this is worse than Elixir. Not just because, like, the characters are bad, or the plot is bad or anything, but it is just a mad collection of ravings. So, yes, this is, this is the worst series I've ever read. It's, not, it's still not worse than Lovely Bones, and stop asking me to do a video on it. I talked about it in my top 10 worst videos, and that, that, that's, or my top 10 worst books video, and that's, that's all I want to say about it, okay? It's, it's terrible. So I just want to give a quick update real quick. Um, in the original poll that I believe I mentioned, I had a four book series on there. There's Throne of Glass and House of Night, which are obviously done. And then I had um, Vampire Academy and uh, The Fifth Wave on there as well. And I've decided I'm not going to do Vampire Academy because... Like I said, I read the first book uh, years ago, and while it was bad, it wasn't really all that bad. There was still stuff in there that I enjoyed, and honestly, like, this came out around the same time as House, House of Night and Vampire Academy came out around the same time, so I'm not going to say either of them is a ripoff of the other. They're both kind of a ripoff of Harry Potter, but um, Vampire Academy is, like, doing pretty much the same thing as House of Night, but at least the first book was, well, it really wasn't that bad. So I doubt that the rest of the series is going to top this at all. And I'm not saying that every bad book I read from now on has to top this. It would have to, it would have to try really hard to do that. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do Vampire Academy. I've decided I'm going to replace it with Fallen by, uh, by Lauren Kate, I believe. And I saw the movie for Fallen a few weeks ago. It was... Oh god, it was hilariously bad. It was so awful. I hated it. I hate. I hated it so much, and I loved how much I hated it. But and there's that, and the fifth wave. I will probably do the fifth wave before I do Fallen, just because um, Fallen is also about like you know magic and fallen angels and stuff. So I'm like, eh, I I I want to get away from that uh, wheelhouse a little bit, even if I'm looking for stuff that's terrible. So. Uh, yeah, the fifth wave is going to come before that. I And I really want to get uh, Michael Bloomberg's daughter's horse books in there somewhere. But honestly, e even all the bits I've read from them, I just don't know if there's uh, enough material to do a whole video like this. So we'll, we'll see what I do with that. But uh, yeah, so whatever, I, whatever terrible book series I read next, uh, there's going to be a gap. <laughs> there was originally supposed to be a much bigger gap between Throne of Glass and this, but Throne of Glass just took me a lot longer. And this one, I really just wanted to get it over and done with uh, while I was in quarantine. And, um, yeah, th thanks a whole bunch for watching. Thanks again for watching if you got this far. And uh, if you're a patron, your name should be up here. Thanks to you guys, especially Apo Savalainen, Brother Santodes, Christopher Hawkins, Christopher Quinten, Joel, Joseph Pendergraft, Taylor Briggs, Tobacco Crow, and Ve Victus. You guys are, you guys are pretty great. And... Obviously, if you watch this far, you're pretty great, too. This thing is almost two hours long, and let me tell you, it was it was painful. Not just reading, but also having to record it and going back and editing everything. And I'm sorry if I didn't touch on every little bit that you wanted me to, but seriously, if I did that, this video would be five hours long. And if you're really curious about the unpleasantness of this series, uh, check it out yourself. It's genuinely pretty funny. Anyways, I'll see you next time. Bye.